It is my absolute privilege to introduce Paul Rowland. He's a good friend of mine and I've known him for quite some time, so I'm extremely pleased that he was able to make the trip over here today to be with us. So Paul Rowland has been the Executive Director of the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, or AISHI, since 2009. He came to that position after more than 20 years in higher education as a professor and administrator. Before working in higher education, Paul worked in social services and in secondary education where he became a leader in environmental education. Paul has written dozens of articles about science education, environmental education and sustainability. His work at AISHI has led to the organisation receiving awards from the US Green Building Council, the Society for College and University Planning and the North American Association for Environmental Education. We've formed a, a very close relationship with AISHI Acts and AISHI work together quite well and as you know we have our resource sharing as a result of that relationship. So please welcome to the stage Executive Director of AISHI, Paul Rowland. Thank you Leanne. It, it truly is a pleasure to be here and this is my first trip to Australia and I'm just having a wonderful time here. It is, it's, it's more than I imagined and if you've seen my Facebook page I actually cuddled the koala already so <laughs> <laughs> life is good. Um, it, it, one of the reasons I think it's really important for me to be here today though is because Axe has become an international leader in campus sustainability. Uh, during the past year the um, the Rio Plus 20 conference provided an opportunity for higher education to come forward and exert its presence as a place where sustainability and sustainable development could be moved forward. And indeed, as we started discussions about a year and a half ago uh, about how we might have some influence at, at Rio Plus 20, we, we really were just kind of dreaming about the idea that maybe higher education might actually be noted in the documents that came out of Rio Plus 20. Little did we imagine that there would be a side event that featured higher education and Leanne's work in pulling together that side event uh, was a tremendous step forward and uh, certainly uh, showed the power of acts in being able to pull together uh, not only the Asian uh, organizations that are like us, but also uh, pulling in African, European, and of course U.S., Canada organizations. So it really is a pleasure to be here and to be part of um, a meeting of the folks who, who really do understand, I think, the international, the global aspects of, of sustainability. Not something to be taken for granted, by the way. Well, I, as I was thinking about what I should be talking about, here I, of course, look back at what the theme of the conference was, and, I, and then I thought, you know, there's actually something very important about uh, a holistic approach to sustainability that's embedded in the way we do business at AISHI. We really do believe it takes a campus to create a sustainable future that it doesn't just take an individual, it's not just about the leadership, it's not just about the sustainability staff, it's not just about the faculty, it really does take the whole campus. We have been steadfast in our belief in AISHI that indeed, the campus as a whole has to be engaged in sustainability transformation. And, and as a result of that, we only offer institutional memberships. We don't have memberships for individuals. We've, we constantly get asked about, why don't you have individual memberships? Why, why couldn't you let just individuals from a campus come in? And our argument has been, you have to have enough people on a campus to be committed to becoming an AC member because it's going to take that level of, of broad commitment to move things forward. And so we've resisted calls to have individual membership mainly for a philosophical reason that it does take a campus to create a sustainable future. A few months ago, or a couple months ago, I guess I was asked to provide a virtual interview and, and talk a little bit about why the theme of this conference was important. And I, in that interview, just, I, I won't say inadvertently, but without much thought, uh, came up with four, four words that were then the pull-out quote that had to do with commitment, conversation, coordination, and celebration. 
And I think it's worth spending a little time talking through why I had put those words into that uh, interview. I also thought about some other C words, collaboration, conservation, and certainly we all probably have days where we think about consternation. Um, but um, I do want to talk about the, the, the first four Cs um, and talk a little bit about why they're important and what they have meant and how they've played out with some of our institutions in the US and Canada. I, probably should apologize for the fact that I'm going to use a lot of US language and terminology that may or may not be familiar to you. Um, it's payback for reading the newspaper. I think we're, there's times I have no idea what the newspaper is telling me <laughs> since I've been here. But um, at any rate, I, I will try to uh, make some uh, clarity in, in the comments that I make that may not be clear from the language difference. Well, the first word that I threw out was commitment. And all of you in this room have made some kind of commitment, at least at the individual level of saying, I'm going to do something. I'm going to get together with people who understand sustainability, and I'm going to spend time learning from them. That's why you're here today. But there's all kinds of individual commitments that are taking place on your campuses. Those commitments are important. They are necessary, but they are not sufficient. Um, typically, people with similar kinds of commitments come together at some point and start making group commitments. For example, we have faculty and programs who get together and say, we need to ensure that our graduates all have an understanding of sustainability, so we're going to make sure we've got courses in our program to do that. Or a group of uh, faculty on a campus will come together and they will make statements uh, that we need a sustainability minor or a major or whatever. Um, the same thing happens on our operations side where um, a group of people in, in the facility side, the state side, will, will start talking about energy management and how energy management comes together and how we need to, um, if we're going to make progress in energy management, we need to start monitoring it on a building process, building level, and we need to make sure that those, that information is made public so that there's actually pressure put upon people to, to change their behaviors and their energy use within their buildings. So there are group commitments that are very important. There's another level of commitment, though, that we've found in the states that, that I think is uh, become especially important to, to us, and that is the institutional commitment. And that is where, at the highest levels, an institution makes a commitment to change itself. And Professor Pankhurst, I think, has probably shown us some of the examples of what you do here in, in Australia in changing an institution. Um, we have about, I think we're around 670, 680 universities and colleges in the U.S. that have signed the American Colleges and Universities President's Climate Commitment. In that commitment, those presidents have signed off on saying that they will ensure that their campus becomes carbon neutral. And they will set a date for that. So in all 670 some institutions, they have made a commitment to carbon neutrality and they've set a date for that particular point. They have also signed off on saying that they will ensure that all of their students understand climate change and sustainability. Now that's a big commitment for a president to make and it's not made lightly, but it is made with a bit of pressure because as we started to see from the original 40 or so who, who came together and said, yeah, this is a good idea, we ought to make these kinds of commitments, we started to see pressure being placed on other presidents, not only from the presidents at the institutions near them, but also from their students who came forward and said, you need to make these kinds of commitments. So these commitments actually then lead to some kinds of action. And I think that's a critical part of starting to mobilize, is getting individuals to make commitments, moving those to group commitments, but eventually getting institutional commitments that are made at the highest levels of the institution. Now, the, the commitments that I've been talking about have been commitments to practices or commitments to a specific kind of an objective. There's also another important type of commitment that's going on among our institutions, and that is a commitment to a vision of the future. 
and that is through strategic planning, we make a commitment to become a type of institution or become a future that's important. And this has been a critical part, I think, of a number of institutions who have really gone beyond saying we're going to do sustainability to saying that sustainability is core to what we do. Um, Green Mountain College, which is a small liberal arts college in Vermont, uh, just recently went through a strategic planning process. And in the strategic plan, they decided rather than say, well, we'll have a paragraph in there about sustainability, they decided to have sustainability throughout the plan. It is the foundation of their plan, and it's now the foundation of everything that institution does. It can't make a decision without thinking about sustainability. Those kinds of commitments to a vision of the future I think are going to be critical. I think that's what's going to get us to mobilize a holistic approach to sustainability. Okay, my second C. One of the ways you get there is obviously through conversation. There's conversations, I've been having these conversations for 20 odd years, some of them have been odd years too, um, about uh, sustainability. And one of the things we often fall back on are the conversations with the people who believe the things we do. The easy conversation, the conversation that you'll be having here among people who believe sustainability is a very important construct. Those are necessary and you shouldn't ignore them, but again, they're not sufficient. It's important to have fruitful conversations among those who have open minds. People who may not agree with you, but who are willing to consider what you bring forward. Those conversations are sometimes more difficult to initiate, but they're the ones that, that provide you with the most fruit. And maybe conversations with others in your own unit, or it may be conversations with your administration. But those conversations are essential if we're going to move beyond the small groups on our campuses who are advocates for sustainability to actually getting a whole campus to make a move to sustainability. I say that having recognized in the states a number of our institutions that have um, very good sustainability practices going on, but they're really being pushed by a very small number of people who just happen to have control of funds to make those things happen. Uh, sometimes those folks are over in uh, our facility side, sometimes they're in dining services, sometimes they're in the academic side, but, but frequently what we find is that the number of people on a campus who are actually committed to sustainability is quite small. We ask our members uh, about a year ago, you know, what percentage of your, mem uh, of your campus actually understands that they're a member of AISHI because everybody on a campus is a member of AISHI. It's less than 5% typically. It's less than 1% quite often. That means that 95 to 99% of the people don't understand that they have access to the resources that we're providing to them. A real challenge for us is to move beyond the actors for sustainability to really embedding sustainability throughout the institution. And that takes conversations with the open-minded. There's a third type of conversation that I'm going to advise you to not engage in. And it's difficult for me to say don't engage in conversations, but certainly don't spend a lot of time in the fruitless conversations with the deniers and the pessimists. They will burn you out, quite literally. Um, I've been through those conversations before, and I've found that the most important thing you can do is walk away from the conversation and simply understand that not only will you not agree, you probably won't even agree to disagree, you'll probably just disagree. <laughs> and you need to conserve your energy for those middle conversations, the fruitful ones with the open-minded. I, I hate to say that to somebody, is don't have conversations with people, but it can be so all-consuming and you'll miss opportunities to have the good conversations. One of the things to have good conversation, though, is to structure the conversation. You can't have a good conversation without some kind of structuring. So how do you build the structures for conversations? Casual conversations are fine and they're good starting points, but typically to create some kind of um, 
large-scale action or large-scale commitment is going to take some kind of structure. One approach is to infiltrate existing committees, particularly those that do strategic planning and budgeting. Um, I had the opportunity when I was at Northern Arizona University, I, I was in a position called the Director of Academic Assessment, most hated man on campus, by the way. Um, and in that position, uh, I had the opportunity to go around to all of the different departments, the academic departments, and, and ask them to produce assessment plans, which was an anathema to virtually everyone. Um, but it, the, the spin off of that was that I was placed on the Strategic Planning and Budgeting Committee. Little did I know that that was the group that really set the direction for the institution. Those kinds of committees that are active in setting direction for an institution are ones that you need to infiltrate in whatever way you can, but you need to be able to get on those committees and spend the tedious time it takes to serve. The other approach that we've seen very successful is to be creative and create new committees. Now, the last thing an institution, a bureaucratic institution like a university needs is another committee, but a sustainability committee? Hmm, sounds pretty good. And we have seen sustainability committees bring together people from throughout the university community and have conversations that never would occur if those committees had not been formed. And so uh, many of our institutions, and I'll show you some data on this, have formed sustainability committees and have pulled together uh, staff, faculty, administrators, and students in many cases to have conversations about how the institution becomes more sustainable. Many of these committees report to a president or a vice president which gives them even greater influence uh, than they would have if they were just a group of people having casual conversations. I'm probably with a deputy vice chancellor here in the room, I shouldn't say this, but agitate. Uh, sometimes you have to agitate. Uh, I recall when I, I was at Northern Arizona, uh, a group of us um, got together and we said, you know, the, the university's not moving very fast. We're all working ourselves to death about sustainability and not much is happening up at the top. How about we hold a convocation? Uh, we call together the faculty of the university to discuss the topic, should Northern Arizona University be, the, be known as the environmental university? And uh, of course, we went through the process of getting our leadership there from various aspects, our, our top researchers, uh, some of our top faculty, some of our top staff, and then we invited the president to come into the conversation. And by doing that, it forced the president to recognize that indeed, there was a groundswell of support for becoming an environmental university. It took several years but eventually that president did indeed take a major step forward, uh, became one of the early signers of the president's climate commitment and has, has engaged that university in environmental work since then. Sometimes you have to agitate. Sometimes uh, you, you do have to get out there and be a little more proactive. If the committees don't work, if the conversations aren't going anywhere, yeah. Bring people together in a variety of ways. Um, expositions, we held poster sessions where we'd get people from around the campus to come together at the student union, put up posters about all the sustainability work that was going on to create a, a level of visibility. Those are the kinds of things that create structure for conversations. Uh, coordination, and we could call it collaboration, we could probably call it um, a, a lot of other things, but, but let me just use the word coordination. Sometimes that's probably more realistic than um, full-scale collaboration. Uh, there's an interesting idea about how you start collaborating, and one of them actually seems to be somewhat negative, but I think of it as very positive, and that's this idea of silo busting. Uh, we talk in the States a lot about the silos of a campus. And they are silos in, in every sector of the campus. Uh, within our operations side, we have our purchasing people sit over here, our facilities folks sit here, our dining services sit here, our housing people are here, and so on. All of them work relatively independently. They may all report to the same vice president, 
but they operate almost completely independently, which when you think about purchasing as operating independently of all the people who are buying things. And then on the academic sides, of course, every discipline is its own silo and is, is a strong advocate of the separation and the uniqueness of what they have to contribute. So one of the key things to do coordination first is to go in and do silo busting. And by the way, I've set up two silos that are probably the hardest to bust. That is the operations, versus the academics, and it's versus in most of our campuses. And getting them to work together has been a major challenge. But if you're going to have a holistic approach, if you're going to use the campus as a learning living laboratory, you're going to have to bust that silo. And that's going to be a challenge. Um, part of that comes from listening to others. Part of it comes from creating more opportunities for dialogue across that. And that's been the beauty of some of those committees, by the way. The sustainability committees that pull people from all sectors of the uh, university have been especially important in getting the conversation started started that helps break down the silos and helps find those relationships. Another thing we've found that's been helpful is to um, bring groups together to do joint planning on a variety of projects. Typically, facilities plans the facilities projects fairly independently of what the academic side does with them. Typically, academics plan every single thing they teach independent of what's going on on the campus. Bringing people together across those kinds of barriers and starting to reach out across barriers is critical. Um, I, one of my board members, should I talk about my board members? Yeah. <laughs> one of my board members actually um, uh, is doing a lot of blogging now. And one of his blogs was a, a critique of how sustainability officers and sustainability staff were not very good at engaging um, the, the folks from uh, the diversity uh, sectors of the campus. We have diversity officers, we have multicultural centers and so forth, and, and that there should be more engagement across those. And um, he was advocating for that. And I asked him, uh, because he runs these things by me as he's putting them out, and I said, when was the last time you actually went over and had a conversation in their office? He said, well, I don't, I, I ask them to come and talk with me and they never come. I said, when was the last time you actually took, and he has, uh, uh, dozens of students who work for him. When was the last time you actually offered to have one of your students work on a project for them? He said, yeah, I get it. <laughs> the sharing has to be two-way. If we want to engage people, we have to share credit for things that get accomplished, and we have to share our resources. So it is not simply a matter of being able to say, we need you to work with us if we're going to move forward on sustainability. The question I think you have to ask yourself is, how can sustainability efforts contribute to what they need to get done? Because if indeed sustainability is foundational, and I believe it is, I think it's foundational to everything we do, it must have something to do with what other people are doing as their core activities. What is it? What is it that sustainability can contribute to them? And that's the important piece. Just to show you some of the need for coordination, here's how I think of the campus sustainability puzzle. These are the categories of ACE STARS, the Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating System. And you can see it covers the whole university. There's virtually no one at a university that doesn't contribute something to what we're calling campus sustainability and the way we're measuring it with the STARS system. And I think you'll find the same thing with life system. Basically, everybody's in the game. Now that's an interesting concept. When you think about everybody's contributing something to sustainability or failing to contribute something to sustainability, that means that we really do need to engage everyone in these conversations. We've actually found some interesting things from, from STARS and the institutions that have adopted it. We have about uh, 300, I think 330, 340 institutions that either have used STARS or are currently using it. We have more than 200 that have completed their rating process. One of the first things we heard was that the conversations on campuses 
had expanded dramatically because of this measurement process. By measuring all these different things and trying to pull it together into a single measurement system, we were having conversations that were taking place with faculty, with facilities, with dining, with purchasing. All these different groups were having to make contributions to the data that was being required by the STARS system. As a result of measuring, we were able to get conversations going on campuses that had never occurred. Sustainability officers were going out and having conversations with department chairs that they'd never met before. Sustainability officers were going out and talking to people in dining services that they hadn't met before. It really was transformative to have a tool that really allowed people to have conversations about everything that goes on on a campus. And that's campus sustainability. Here's a few excerpts from some of the things we found about STARS. I thought it might be useful to, to throw out a few of these. These are from about a month ago. Um, I remember I mentioned strategic planning is a very important part about what we need to be doing in our sustainability efforts, is that we need to be engaged in it. It turns out that of the first 193 institutions that had submitted their STARS reports, um, that uh, the strategic plans for 81% of them included the environmental dimension of sustainability in their, in their strategic plan. These are the institutional strategic plans. And you can see somewhat lower percentages for the social and economic dimensions. And, and uh, still though, 68% of these institutions included all three dimensions of sustainability as part of their strategic plan. I find that relatively impressive. And we haven't been having these conversations about sustainability very long on our campuses. Now, admittedly, the first couple hundred institutions that report their sustainability um, uh, are going to be leaders in the field. But it does show that there are models out there for how sustainability can become part of a strategic plan and how it can become embedded in the decision making of a campus. Here's a few more pieces from our, our big data. I call it the big data because uh, there's, there's about 500 data points in a report. You take 500, 200 institutions and growing, it's a lot of data that we're starting to look at now. <clears throat> um, the campus plan includes sustainability at a high level. 82% are reporting that. Um, me, does it have a sustainability plan? 64% do, 66% um, have plans to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. Now remember in the states, we don't have laws, we don't have rules, we don't have anything that makes us do much of anything when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. These are commitments that are being made by the institution on their own without any, any, any rule or force that's pushing them in that direction. And um, to do that, um, there's a fair amount of uh, buying of carbon offsets that's taking place, supporting the development of renewable energy technologies, essentially. Last thing I want to just mention very briefly, and maybe too briefly, is that when you're doing things well, celebrate them. It's often too depressing to hang around with, with folks who are talking about sustainability and what doesn't get done. It's important that you have celebrations. Celebrations of all sorts. Celebrations do a number of things. One, they lift you up, right? They make you feel better about it all. But they also provide a level of exposure that you don't get in day-to-day -day affairs. So media releases. A number of our campuses, when they get their STARS report back and they get a, a silver rating or bronze rating even, they put out a press release, the president has a news conference, and they celebrate with the media that, that they have, have now um, measured and been found worthy in their sustainability efforts. Award ceremonies, I've, I've shown you the, the Green Brick Award that comes from uh, one of the North, I think North Carolina State. Um, they have an award ceremony. Many of our campuses have award ceremonies where they give out sustainability awards, receptions, parties are always a nice thing of course, um, but also electronic recognitions, website pages that provide recognition to um, leaders of sustainability on campus, outstanding uh, departments, things like that. Most of all though, in sustainability you have to find the joy, right? 
If it's not fun, something's wrong. So find the joy in the sustainability, whether it's joy from the satisfaction of doing the job well, or whether it's the joy of, I don't know, going out into your yard and picking a tomato. That's where I find a lot of my joy in sustainability. So here's my coda. When you're dealing with sustainability, understand first that the work is difficult. It is. You're trying to change institutions. That's not easy. It's complex because these are complex institutions. They're bureaucracies. Changing bureaucracies is difficult. And quite honestly, we rarely know the answers. There are multiple answers and we have to choose the best we can. Um, but we also have to know that there are other answers out there and we need to be open to exploring them. We know we can always do better. No matter how good we think our sustainability is, even if we get some of our campuses to be what we call the platinum level campuses in the US, they can always do better. It's urgent. I think you folks probably understand that better than a lot of my colleagues in the States, but it is urgent. Um, we have to do things soon, especially with respect to issues like climate change. But we also must be thoughtful and mindful as we do it. We need to think through, we, we talk about, we got here because people didn't understand unintended consequences. Well, we have to think through what are the unintended consequences. I do this with my staff, it drives them nuts all the time. My staff will come to me and say, hey, should we do this? I said, what are the unintended consequences? Well, no, 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 here's what we, here's what will happen if we do this. I said, what are the unintended consequences? And of course, then they go nuts and go back and they say, oh man, this guy's a pain in the neck. But that's sustainability. You can't think sustainably if you're not thinking about what are the unintended consequences of what you do. So you have to be thoughtful. You have to be mindful. Because it's urgent, there's no dilly-dallying around. Can't put things off. Can't say, well, you know, let's wait for another VC to come in or let's wait for uh, another government or whatever. Can't dilly-dally, sorry. On the other hand, you can't make rash judgments. You have to think them through. You have to think about how they'll play out. And you have to think of them not only in terms of technically how do they play out, but how do they play out behaviorally and socially. Those are harder pieces to work through, but they're critical pieces. And yeah, once again, it has to be fun, but you have to take it really seriously. So as you go through the conference, I hope you'll think about how in the next couple of days, you're going to have a lot of fun and you're going to seriously learn a lot about how to create a sustainable society, a sustainable campus, a sustainable world. Know that it's worth it. It is. Thank you. <laughs>